Welcome back to the show. Today's guest is Dr. Robert Kroger. He is the founder of Blood Origins, a hunting nonprofit. And there's some really interesting stuff that we talk about in this conversation, like, is it okay to kill an elephant? And what a healthy ecosystem looks like. And the hunters are actually the ones that are contributing to saving environment and environmental conservation. There's a lot of cool stuff that you dive into. And um, even I found out that some of his greatest conversations have been with vegans who have said, if I were to eat meat, I would hunt it. Well, Robbie, welcome to the show. Yeah, I appreciate it. Super honored and humbled to be here. Uh, thankful that you even said yes to a random cold DM that says, hey, what do you think about uh, having a intellectual, straightforward, authentic conversation about hunting? Yeah, I was all about it. <laughs> you were? Yeah. When I heard it, when I heard, I immediately said yes. That sounds amazing. Because I've never hunted. And we were talking a little yesterday, but... I've never hunted. I, I, I feel like we're detached from our food. You didn't grow up hunting? No, I didn't. I'm Grew from California. Here? Oh, okay. Yeah, if you kill something out there. <laughs> my wife's brother killed a turkey uh, when he was young. And the uh, wildlife people showed up. And they were like, we could put you in jail and uh, charge you this much. And Did luckily, he do it without a license? Yeah. Okay, well, then that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. He was young and dumb. But anyway, enough about that. Uh, tell me about this hat I'm wearing. And also, I want to know about you, and I want our audience to hear about you and your background and yeah. what you do, yeah. uh, Blood, or Blood Origins, yep. the nonprofit, yep. how you got into it. So let's just start with a little about you, your background. Sure. So the hat you're wearing is a nonprofit organization that I started. I started it seven years ago in concept as an idea. And the idea stemmed from this, this place that hunting and hunters have a bad reputation. If you polled the general public, you may have probably a very good portion of that public that says, hmm, I've seen hunters do some really bad stuff. Or I've seen hunting not be seen in the best light. But hunting and hunters are probably at the forefront of conservation all around the world. And they do amazing things for wildlife. And they do amazing things for people. And they do amazing things for communities. And the heart of a hunter is incredible. But we've just never shown it. We've just never shown that side of things. And so, I, as you can tell, I'm not from Tennessee. I'm not from Mississippi, even though I've spent 21 years in Mississippi. Um, I'm originally from South Africa. And growing up in South Africa as a kid, here, if you grew up as a kid in California, you want to be a policeman, you want to be a fireman, you want to be a lawyer, you want to be whatever, right? We want to be the same things in South Africa, but we also want to be a game ranger. And so the game ranger is the guy who has the gun on his shoulder, always driving the Land Rover around, and he's got all the tourists in the back, and he's showing them an elephant and a lion and showing them the tracks and breaking off a branch and saying, okay, you see this tree, you can fray it to make it into a toothbrush, and see this tree, you can take the leaves and you can crush it and it becomes toothache medicine. That's what I wanted to become. And so you, you sort of, me specifically, was just, I wasn't brought up in the bush in South Africa, but every opportunity I was in the bush. I was in nature. I was connecting with nature, connecting with the bush, understanding wildlife, understanding ecosystems. Then I, you know, once I finished high school, I went and did all of my degrees. I've got a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Conservation Biology, um, an Honours in Botany, a Master's in Botany. I came to the States to do a PhD, so I'm Dr. Robert Kroger um, in Wetland Ecology and Aquatic Biogeochemistry. I've lived in the restoration ecology field for 20 years, which really is a fancy word by, of saying I like to fix things. I like to work with habitats, work with animals, work with resources. And how can we better the resource for people, with people? And so that's sort of been my whole journey, living in the environmental education space, living in the conservation space, loving wildlife, and then my family sort of sort of to take a little bit further back my family's history is is deeply rooted in hunting 
My grandfather immigrated from Germany to Mozambique in 1954, lived the heyday of Africa. So the heyday of Africa is not a lot of people, abundant wildlife, liberal uh, regulations around those wildlife. And you could just live, you could live off the land, essentially. And that's what he did and loved it. My father was grown up in that system. At 16 years old, he hunted a Cape Buffalo. Um, but I grew up in a place where Mozambique had already gone through a civil war. Wildlife had been pretty much ravaged off of the landscape, not from hunting, but from poaching and people just being hungry and civil war. And I grew up in a town in, in South Africa called Johannesburg, which is eight and a half million people. And so I never lived in a circle that was anything but urban society, right? We went to nightclubs, we did everything that you probably did in California. And hunting was the first thing from your mind. Didn't come across your plate. It didn't, we didn't have social media at the time. There was none of that kind of stuff that influenced you in terms of your opinions around hunting. And if you had asked me what was my opinion around hunting at 18 to 25, I would have been like, I don't know what hunting does. I don't have really an opinion around hunting. And so fast forward to seven years ago, I've become a hunter. I have started hunting things in America. I've started learning about the wildlife system in America. I've started exploring more opportunities around the country as well as internationally. And I quickly realized this problem that we had. And I just had this, this I call it a brain fart, but in a good way. Like, hey, why don't we try and become better storytellers? Can we not just showcase who we are better? Can we not show our hearts better? Can we not show all of these great things that we do better? And that's really the genesis of Blood Origins. It was this idea of communicating to someone like you, who has never hunted, who maybe has aspirations to hunt, and there's lots of you out there, but just has like maybe perceptions or changes of, of, of thought processes around you know, why do they do that? Or what's this? And I've heard about that and I've done this. And so that's what we built it for. We built it for you. We built it to communicate a different side of hunting and hunters. Um, sorry for that long winded answer, but no, it's a big fine. question. No, no, it was perfect. Okay. So that was a lot. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I was told the only person that calls you Robert is my mother, your mother. When she's mad at me. When she's mad at so you. So please, Robbie. So I won't call and you. And the only person who calls me Dr. Kroger are my, were my undergraduate students. So How many times do you get asked if you're related to Kroger grocery All store? the time. And I'll tell you a funny story in that when I was a PhD student here in the United States, I was earning nothing. It was I, was, I think I was at like 9,000 a year or 11,000 a year, something like that. It was minuscule, right? And I had to do everything, pay rent and food and whatnot and... I made ends meet. I was a bouncer in a, in a bar. I got free food. Wherever there was like free food, if you came and watched football and there was free, there's one place that had free hot dogs until the first points were scored in a football game on Monday Night Football. And I was, no, they didn't know my name. They knew me as the guy who came in and ate six hot dogs because I didn't have lunch, didn't have money for lunch, but I knew I was getting a free food, free meal that night. So that's how I'd work. Um, and, and to be honest, where I sit today versus how I arrived in this country is, is really the epitome of the American dream. Like it is, it is well, it is vibrant, it is possible. I'm the living proof of it. Getting back to that, Kroger, I was so poor that I had to buy Christmas presents for my family back home. And so I went to Kroger and I bought Kroger packaged coffee and Kroger branded spaghetti and Kroger branded all sorts of things. And I wrapped it in a Kroger sack packet. And I gave that, that those were my Christmas presents that year to people and people loved it. My whole family loved it. They were like, this is amazing. So oh, that's, that's awesome. my Kroger story. Oh, that's cool, man. That's a creative, fun way to uh, gift someone, you know? Um, so, Blood Origins seven years ago started and now is arguably or the biggest hunting nonprofit in the world. I wouldn't say we're the biggest hunting nonprofit. There's some really big nonprofits. I'd say we're the biggest globally from a digital fingerprint perspective. Okay. There is no other nonprofit working 
you know, in Europe, all across Europe, all across Africa, Australia, New Zealand, conversations in South America. Um, we live in that digital space. That's the space that we need to occupy. It's the space that you live in every day. You've got a phone in your pocket, maybe two phones in your pocket. Everyone in this world typically lives in that space. And so the more that we can broadcast our message in that space, the better we will be seeded from a, a rhetoric perspective for hunting and for it to stay. Right? We're, we're a super small minority of people in the world that hunt. In, in the United States, we're like 4.5% of the population. It's only 13 million of us, 13 to 15 million of us. And that number stays consistent over time. The problem is the American population increases all the time. Mm. So, you know, we're in, we were 14, 15 million when we were 200 million. We're 14 to 15 million now at 360 million. So our numbers aren't increasing. They're staying constant. So, but our percentage of the population is changing and going mm -hmm. lower and lower and lower. So let's talk, let's just start at kind of the beginning because I want to unpack hunting. Okay. Because I think that everybody has an idea of what hunting is. Just a word. It's a trigger word, I think. Yeah, I would agree. Like, uh, I would say killing is probably more of a trigger word. Killing. Yeah. Than hunting. Yeah. You're killing animals. And that's the hunting. point of hunting. Yeah. Let me be honest with you. Yeah. You're killing something. So, but, but we always use this in our culture as well. Hunter gatherers. Right. We use that terminology quite a, a bit and that's thrown around, which is interesting to me because we talk about, uh, you know, psychology and things like that. And, um, even my buddy who's on a carnivore diet right now, uh, people would live mm -hmm. off of meat and proteins in the winter if they didn't have carbs and they could, you know, live off of meat. And so we're very detached from what we were not that long ago, you know, as settlers that everyone was hunting. I, I don't assume. think, I don't think everyone was hunting. And that's, I think the, the point to me talking about the percentages, yeah, okay. we're a small percentage, but I think if you go back in time, hunters were also quite a small percentage of the tribe. Um, I don't think any, I don't think that's why you've got hunter gatherers as a, as a phrase, not the, the entire tribe didn't hunt. There was a select few individuals, both male and female, as proven by archaeological uh, records, that were hunters. There was another set of the tribe that were gatherers. They went out and gathered roots and berries and yams and maybe gathered fish from the river and stuff like that. But there were hunters, very select hunters. And their job was to bring meat back, right? And they weren't always successful. Neither are we today. And so that's why when I talked about hunting and killing, the intent of me going hunting is to kill something. Okay. Because that you have yeah. to, you have yeah. to own that because yeah. that's why you hunt. you're taking a life. Correct. We're not going hiking. We're not going out into the woods and just walking for the purpose of walking. That's hiking. The difference between hunting and hiking is there's a number of differences. Obviously, one, we, we have an intent to find something and kill it. But we also have a, a deeper um, interaction with nature. When you hike, you're going from point A to point B. You look around. Oh, that's beautiful. Oh, that's beautiful. But when you're hunting from A to B, you're constantly thinking about the wind. You're constantly thinking about cover. You're constantly thinking about topography. You're constantly thinking about where's the animal? What's it going to do? What's the behavior? What's my behavior to that animal? You are a part of the system. You're, you're immersing yourself into that habitat, into that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. When you're hiking, you're not doing that. And so when you, when you start sort of picking apart who hunters are, you, you almost can understand why we say we're, we're probably the most conservation-minded individuals or more connect, most connected individuals to the land, to the wildlife, to the habitat because of the way that we act in the system. Yeah. So I have a question because when I think of hunting, okay. I think of, uh, I'm just going to be frank. I think of either there's the ultra wealthy that shoot skeet in their front yard and go 
quail hunting or dove hunting or whatever yep. or geese or yep. some bird yep i think of those guys you know with the nice shotgun and it's over their shoulder and they got the gear on then i think of the redneck i think of this basic person that wants to post a picture on their social media with a deer that's got a 10 point antlers or whatever yep and they're sitting there with this huge animal or you see it in hunting magazines or whatever mm -hmm. and it's like look what i just killed mm -hmm. and those are really the two i guess uh archetypes or avatars of what i would envision as hunters just sitting here sure. at this moment sure how much truth is in that lots of truth you see it all the time. You see it in social media. I would argue, though, that they're probably exactly the same person in terms of what, why they're hunting and, you know, what are they, what are they hunting for? That, that redneck is also going to be hunting for doves September 1st. Same as the ultra wealthy. He's also going to be hunting for doves September 1st. The, the redneck may just have an 870 Remington shotgun that was a $350 shotgun from Walmart, which I have. Or this guy over here has got a $25,000 shotgun over and under from a high-end gun maker in England. They may, they may look differently at each other because of culture, because of traditions, because of status in their communities. But they're both doing the same thing. They're both hunting a species that they love to hunt. That's a very social animal to hunt. It's... You know, dove hunting is you're in the field with your buddies. You've got a very strict limit in how many doves you can harvest. And when you reach that limit, people typically will take the dove breasts right then and there, take them out of the dove, put them with jalapenos and cream cheese and wrap them in bacon, put them on the grill. And that's going to happen from the redneck to the ultra wealthy. They're going to eat the dove exactly the same way because it tastes really good. This guy may have a top end chef doing it. This guy may, may have his buddies doing it, but they're doing exactly the same thing. And they love doing it for the same reasons, because they love being with their buddies and, you know, enjoying the cuisine of the animal and being out for the first time of the year. Typically, September 1st is the first real hunting day of the year. And so you've, you, you definitely have archetypes and, and this, this redneck archetype, I think sometimes is stereotyped that they don't care that they like, they're just a, a blast and, you know, we'll shoot whatever we want kind of scenario. And, and maybe there's a little truth to it, but maybe it's also a little bit unfair. And again, the reason why we belong and why we exist is that there's a story behind this individual that buys his camo from Walmart that buys his ammunition from Walmart. And he may be putting, you know, 70% of the food that his family eats comes from them hunting. This one over here, this individual probably is less than a percent that comes from hunting. So hunting actually means more, you know, from a, a, a next step perspective to this guy than this guy. But what is this guy doing that this guy may not be doing? Well, when it comes to hunting, a lot of people don't understand that there are um, taxes in play in America that were put in place by sportsmen, by hunters back in 1934 to say, man, we need to do something. Like I told you yesterday, I said, white-tail deer is the most prevalent game species that you can hunt here in America. There's 32 million white-tail deer. Six to seven million are taken every year, yet the population stays. 30, between 30 and 32 million every year. And I asked you a question, which was, why do I only see does? Lots of does because it's a reproduction. Lots of does because if you go before 1930, let's just rewind the clock a lot, quite a bit. Before you go, before 1930, there was a, a market for wild game. So people wanted to eat venison in the New Yorks of the world, in the LAs of the world. So it didn't matter what you killed. You just wanted to kill. And this was commercial market hunting. And so there was just, that's why bison disappeared. That's why antelope disappeared. That's why elk disappeared. That's why everything disappeared. Turkeys disappeared. White-tailed deer were at 300,000. And so all these sportsmen that love to hunt, and here's the irony of things, right? People say, 
oh, you hunters, you just gonna you just want to kill, 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 because you just you don't have any semblance of a respect of life or wildlife conservation. We hunt because we want to hunt an animal. If you asked a hundred hunters, would you prefer more animals or less animals? What do you think the answer is? More. More. So does it make any logical sense for hunters to decrease a population for, for something that they love to do? The answer is no. So in 1930, a bunch of sportsmen and, got, and hunters got together with Teddy Roosevelt and they said, okay, we need to build an act. And the act is called the Pittman-Robertson Act. It's, a, it's called PR. And what Pittman-Robertson does is it puts an 11% excise tax on all hunting equipment. Camo, bows, crossbows, guns, ammunition. You don't see it as the end user. The companies see it and it gets taken from them. And it gets put in the treasury of the United States Treasury. And that money flows downstream and flows into every state in the union and funds state parks shooting ranges wildlife conservation areas wildlife research translocations you name it that fund has poured out five almost over 15 billion dollars for wildlife conservation since it started who's paying for that me and the shooters like you you shoot. You like to shoot, right? Yes, yeah. You have no idea that you're, you're contributing. Every time you fire your nine mil, you're putting money into wildlife conservation. Every Inter time. Interesting. So when we think, so there's a juxtaposition between wildlife conservation and killing animals. So when I think conserving, I think of saving uh, or setting aside. Perfect. You know what I'm saying? Yep. And then at the same time, advocating for hunting which, which I'm not very against. selective. So which, that's, that's, so, that's so the juxtaposition. So explain that. Yeah, explain that. So the juxtaposition is, let, again, let's use white tailed deer as an example. Commercial market hunting, irrespective, didn't care. They hunted and killed. I wouldn't say they hunted, but they killed everything. In the PR movement change, there was also a change in value, which was, hey, you recreational hunter now. We're not a market hunter anymore. You're a recreational hunter. You're doing it for enjoyment. And... And hear me for what I'm saying. I'm not saying we, it's the enjoyment of killing because that's not what it is. It's the enjoyment of hunting, of the activity of moving forward through the ecosystem. The chase. The chase, the pursuit, the adventure, the mental and physical torture that you put on yourself, the spirituality that you get from it. All of it is the hunt. The kill is almost anticlimactic because then the hunt's over. But the value went from all animals to this very selective, mature male animal that has big antlers, that has big horns. And what happened then is that the reproductive engine of the population, the does, the young bucks, the fawns, all got left in peace. And so your population grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. And so now you've got a population that can withstand doe harvest and buck harvest. And so you've got to remember that every year, let's use this table as an example. If this is the population this year, next year the population will be here. And if you want to keep the population where my hand is, you have to take this away. That's surplus. That's the top of the bell curve. So if you want to, that's why I say every year we have 30 to 32 million deer. We take 6 million off every year and just stays right here. Interesting. So for me, I'm interested in hunting. Okay. And we talked a little yesterday. And the reason is, um, well, for one, I live in a, a place in Tennessee here in the Nashville area where we have some land and I see deer and my neighbor is an avid hunter and he goes and hunts on his parents' property and they have like a hundred acres or something. So that's like his spot. But I'm interested in it for more of the, sp like the spiritual side uh, because I'm so far removed from food and 
I eat beef, chicken, pork because what's available in the grocery store? Like those are what the meats are. Oh, and turkey. It's like these are predominantly what you're going to eat for dinner. We're either going to have in my house beef or chicken. Okay. So I never really think like, oh, I'm going to go eat uh, deer because what does uh, the big agriculture uh, and what is it? The FDA, I guess. Mm Mm-hmm. Are, are they in charge or who's because who, who, all these cow lots who controls that usda usda and yeah. fda and fda yeah okay so like that's the food that's being essentially pushed upon the american correct. person correct now we're trying to eat grass-fed all right like no antibiotics grass-fed all that but as it's expensive as, as healthy as possible we're trying to do organic fruits vegetables etc perfect now, that's just a decision we made because of research we've done on our own, and that's how we feel. But uh, I want to do it because I feel like I'm so far removed from my food and that someone somewhere takes care of killing the animal and turning it into ground beef or whatever, or the steak that I'm eating. And um, we never think about the death, the killing. So I think we don't like to think about the killing as uh, people especially when I think about killing a female deer because in our society and as humans, like as for me, I value women. <laughs> so I take my human values and I place them upon animals as well. So I would never harm a woman or a female. Sure, sure. And so when it comes to like killing a female deer that has the ability to make a little Bambi, it's like, how could I ever pull the trigger on that? You're one step. Look, you're already one step further along than most people and that you recognize that the meat in the grocery store died. Yeah. I cannot tell you how many comments we get in social media that says, stop killing animals. Just go get your meat from the grocery store. <laughs> Can you believe it? That's what they say. And you're like, well, where do you think that came from? Why would you say to me, go get something that I know nothing about, that I don't know how they lived. I don't know how they died. I don't know what they were fed. I don't know what they were injected with. I know not, I don't know whose hands have touched the meat. I know nothing. And I'll just go pick it up. Or I know where the animal lived. I know the conditions it lived in. I probably have a good idea of how old it is. I know exactly how it died. I know exactly whose hands touched it, typically only mine. And I know how it was prepared. Well, you'll know how it was prepared. So, and I know that it was completely natural. It lived an amazing life. It had all of its days were good until it had one bad day when it met me. And I ended its life as ethically, as efficiently, as lethally as possible. Probably didn't even know what happened. And, and living off like the, the land, right? What you want, grass fed, better than grass fed, berry fed, you know? That's what, that's what the meat is. And so it's, a, it's impressive that you're like, I wanna know, I wanna be more connected to my food because that, that really is a, an avenue of a lot of people's reasoning for hunting. Going back to your example of the rich person and the redneck, that redneck may not be um, as, forward thinking from a, I want to, I want to be more healthy in my eating. He's doing it just from a pure economics perspective. I can put six deer in the freezer and it'd be less than, you know, 12 ribeyes kind of scenario. And the other thing you will find, and you might've found this with your neighbor already is we're willing to share this amazing, amazing food, this amazing meat right? You want some ground beef? You want some Nilgai steaks? I'll send it to you. Package done. I've paid for all the processing already. I'll give it to you. Have you ever heard of somebody going to the grocery store, buying 12 ribeyes, coming home and calling you up and say, hey, Stefan, you want a ribeye? I got one. I'll give it to you for free. You've never heard of it. But it happens all the time in hunting. 
because everyone understands the value of that that animal and they want to share that animal they want to share that food they want to share hey this is what happened this is the adventure this was the hunt it's not just you're going to eat this beautiful piece of meat that is super nutritionally dense but it's also going to be hey live this thing with me you weren't there with me but let me tell you about it mm -hmm. that's cool man uh because my neighbor yeah anybody i know that hunts deer specifically back to a white tail wants to share mm -hmm. uh, and he has a smoker and he'll make sausage out of it and stuff and it's really cool and yeah, yeah that's an interesting perspective about ribeyes <laughs> nobody's gonna go to the grocery store nobody. and call me up nobody but you also get a surplus of uh, meat from the animal and so economically speaking i'm interested in a couple things um the price per pound let's just stick with deer like if you were to go kill a deer and then have it, I don't know what the correct term is. Processed. Processed, yep. yeah, packaged, freeze-dried, yep. all that. Mm -hmm. And you could slap it in the freezer in your garage. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the price per pound comes out to be, roughly? It's more expensive than what you buy in the grocery store. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so it's more expensive. Do you know by how much? I don't because it all varies, right? So and I'll, location, like for here, it might be cheaper than it would be in another state. Yeah, and for instance, you may have bought a gun, so you got to factor in all these costs, right? Yeah, you might have bought a gun ten years ago that you're still using today. You've got a box of ammunition that's twenty. If you're really good, you just need one bullet, right? One bullet's probably three bucks a bullet, right? The processing fee on a, on a dough that's going to yield 80 pounds of meat or 90 pounds of meats probably going to run at you know three dollars a pound or four dollars a pound so you're in it for 300 400 bucks maybe depends on the process it depends on what you want are you getting breakfast sausage are you getting link sausage all those kinds of things factor in then you've got your vehicle and your gas and whatnot and then it also depends on your circumstance right your redneck the cost per pound of meat is going to be much 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 less than the rich guy who's got a $50,000 gun mm -hmm. tied to it, right? But I like to say that, again, going back to the ribeye example, the, the filet that we get, the backstrap that we get out of a deer, the filet mignon, essentially, it's, it's so much better for you health from a health-wise perspective. But I'm willing to give that to you as we've talked about. And I'm willing to give it to you because, and it, it probably is going to cost because I've went and let's just call it an elk steak, right? I've driven 16 hours to Colorado and back and processed it. That elk steak's probably worth 15 times what a filet mignon is in the grocery store, which then adds on top of the fact that I'm willing to give it to you versus yeah. a filet out the, out the store and I'm not. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Um, I want to talk about nutrition because I think that you said something really interesting that kind of caught my attention uh, about you said uh, nutrition dense, I believe was the term you used. Nutritionally use. dense. Nutritionally dense. Mm -hmm. When we were talking about having killed and processed the dough and what you're eating, what you're putting in your body. Uh, can you expound upon the nutritionally dense and what that looks like? And again, I think that just for the sake of this, we're sticking with a deer for now, because yeah. I think it's the thing that I think of and that is most prevalent that we probably see in most areas, or at least that I've been, you know, I'm not a, again, like I haven't hunted. I'm not a hunter, sure. but I want to, but you're going to help me. And, uh, <laughs> and so, the nutritional factor of a deer can you tell me that is that that i know it's a red meat it's very dense red meat um you're going to find that it's going to have a number of micronutrients that are present in it without any additives uh, but probably the most critical nutritional information that i can give you is when you weigh up an ounce of deer meat versus an ounce of beef or an ounce of chicken, you're gonna get f more protein per ounce of that meat than any other meat. 
Same thing with pheasant. When you take a pheasant against a chicken, there's going to be more protein per ounce of that meat to any other meat. So again, if you talk to a CrossFitter, you talk to somebody who's in the carnivore well, that's what, diet. Yeah, that's so interesting to me because like I'm as a like someone that is trying to get in shape. Yep. It's always eat your body weight or your goal body weight in protein per day. And it's like that is so hard to do. And so I was not wondering if you, not about if you stack three deer in the freezer. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask, man. So like what would do you know the math on if I had an eight ounce let's say uh, uh, sirloin or ribeye versus an eight ounce deer steak? I don't, I don't. I think one of the number that's coming into my brain is like 26 grams. But again, I don't know what the 26 grams is okay. in response to, like in terms of this, the portion size. Yeah. Um, but I know it was 26 to say 21 or 26 to 20 in terms of the, the protein differences between venison and say beef. But there is a difference. There is a difference. And yeah, that, just Google it. You can just Google any sort of venison protein per ounce. And you're probably going to come. And then I would hit images. And what it's going to come up with is lots of uh, infographics that have compared various meats to venison, to pheasant, to duck, to geese, that kind of stuff, to fish. Okay, cool. So I did a poll on my Instagram yesterday. And I said... Is hunting bad? Is hunting bad? That was I saw my that. Poll. I responded no. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so um, uh, the people that said yes, I think that they had. What was the some, percentage? I don't know. Let me. See. I forgot to put my phone on airplane mode, but let me see if it's still up. Because it should be still up. Or you can go to the archives and find it. I, su I suck it social media um let's see this lady messaged me so it was 92 percent no eight percent yes wow that's amazing and this i but i got uh someone dm'd me and okay, said what'd she say for food no for sport kinda so, what so is, what's the difference? Yeah, I don't know. I think that she was saying probably for sport just to kill the kill. But who does that? That's my question. Who kills to kill? That's that's the, my question. Do you think, let me ask this, I'll just throw a question back at you. Yeah. Do you believe right now, answer honestly, do you believe that hunters go out and shoot something and enjoy the kill and then walk away? Uh, I would say probably a extremely small percentage i would say that small percentage are not hunters they're that poachers small percent, uh, uh, percentage of poachers yeah or people that have no respect for wildlife yeah it doesn't matter where you go in this planet if somebody's hunting something there's either a law and a regulation in place that requires you to take all the meat with you it's called wanton waste or all of that meat is taken out of the field and given to communities, given to people, or used in the game meat market like in England that is then put in restaurants and put in grocery stores and whatnot. There is a, a very small percentage that are not hunters that are seeking the thrill of just killing something. If somebody goes, oh, you guys, like that lady says, kind of bad, if we're, if we're the thrill-seeking, killing kind of people that everyone thinks we are. That just wants to put antlers on a wall. Or just wants to kill. Yeah. Why are we not volunteering our services at the local butcher or the local vo uh, abattoir? Go kill everything. you Go kill until your heart's content. There's lots of cows that are dying every day. Lots of sheep, lots of pigs, lots of chicken. Go kill. Why do we have such low percentage uh, or percentage? Like I just went, I just came from uh, hunting elk in Oregon. Okay. Do you know what the success chances of me killing an elk with a bow where I was? Very low. 8%. So what does that tell you? Did you get, kill one? I did. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, but what does that tell you? 
92% of the chance, 92% of the time, you're not getting one. Yeah. But you're still hunting with that chance. So there must be something else to it, Stefan. Mm -hmm. There must be, right? It can't be all about killing. It can't be all about sport. But I would argue that it's not, I enjoy it. I enjoy going hunting. That enjoyment is often tied in with this idea that you love killing. No. When 92% of the time I'm not going to kill and I still enjoy it, then I must enjoy it for other reasons that are probably bigger reasons than killing. Mm. Exercise, being out in mother, with Mother Nature, communing with your creator, meeting new people, being in new landscapes, in new places, learning new things, becoming better adept at being in the woods, becoming a better woodsman. So the kinder, I get it. Don't get me wrong. I get it. That's the PR problem that we have. But it's this, and it all comes down again to the, the finality of the point here is, it all comes down to the fact that sport, going out and sport hunting, enjoyment hunting, is tied to that kill. Which often not doesn't happen. And if it does... Let's assume it does. Then all that animal is used. All the meat's used. All the meat's given away. And what's the most useless part of the animal? Probably it's skeleton. It's the thing head. that went on the wall. Yeah. The most useless part is the antlers. Yeah. Can't do anything with them. Yeah. Even in Pakistan, the guy in Pakistan will tell you, oh, the reason I'm letting you take your horns with you is because... We don't need it. We're keeping the cape. We're keeping the meat. We're keeping the bones. Yeah. Take the horns and the skull. We don't need it. Yeah. Why would you not take it? Let's talk about the, the kind of sanctity of the deer when it came to Native Americans and how they used every part of it. I think that's interesting because I think it sheds a different perspective and a different light on hunting. Um, because that's what sustained culture mm -hmm. and sustained groups of people. Um, and where I'm from, there was a lot of uh, Native Americans in near in and near around Coloma, California, where the gold rush happened. And and it's cool to learn a little about how they used the tendons to create. Uh, bows, strings, strings yeah. and how they use the bones for all kinds of little utilities and tools and things like that. But they used every part of the animal. And uh, they also viewed the animal in a way with great respect. I don't know like the religious side or if there was on the spiritual side, but I'm pretty sure it was like a very spiritual thing for the people group at the time. I would think so. If, you know, again... And that's kind of what I want my experience to be like. When I think about the Native American's respect for the animal, that's kind of what I want to have. If I go and I take the life and kill an animal, I want to have respect for it and gratitude for the animal that I killed. But you will. And then be a good steward of it. But you will because that respect and gratitude doesn't end when you take its life. That respect and gratitude comes every time you put its food on its on your plate and you eat it because mm. you're going to remind yourself of that moment you're going to go back and go wow look at what this thing gave me look at what it gave my family is there ever a, a psychological component regarding eating something you killed if you're bothered by the fact that you killed something i'm curious about the psychology of hunting in terms of let's say i just killed a deer and i feel guilty is that a normal emotion Why would you to have feel, i would yeah i think i like, think every hunter feels sad okay i think there's emotion tied to it because you are you are you are almost in the place of the creator you have been given dominion over life and death and you chose to end that individual's 
piece of uh, individual wildlife's life. It's a big deal. It's serious. We take it seriously. Lots of hunters take it seriously. I'm not going to say all, but a lot. All, my, all the people that I know that hunt have deep reverence for animals. And they may, not, they may show it in very different ways. Right? Some pray over the animals, some cry, you know, because it is, again, it's a very serious emotional endeavor that you just undertook. But then it, it moves beyond that. It, be, it moves to gratitude, which is typically the next thing, right? The, great, the, the gratitude of being able to take the animal very ethically, very efficiently, very lethally. It didn't suffer when almost painlessly versus what typically happens in Mother Nature, right? Mother Nature excuse my language, but is, she's a cruel bitch and she has no ethics. She has no morals. There, are, there is no such thing as animal rights in mother nature. They starve to death. They get eaten alive. They get disemboweled alive. You know, they, they, you name it. That's what happens. I watch that planet earth stuff, man. It's, mother it's nature. intense. It's intense. Watching them little water buffaloes get killed in the, on the plains. And it's funny, you know, you mentioned that. I, I chuckle sometimes in terms of the people that comment on the stuff that we do uh, from a hunting perspective. And, oh, how, how dare you take that thing's life? We, and they're the first people that will sit on a water hole and, 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 and be gleeful and take photos and be, and, and be the, the culmination of their photographic safari when they see a lion eat a buffalo and kill a buffalo. They're like, who's, who, who's the sadist? You tell me, right? Um, but I think the, 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 everyone, I don't want to say what you'll experience. I don't want to say how you will experience it. Everyone experiences things very differently. Um, I think though, the fact that you knew or know exactly why you're doing it like you formulated that in your brain of why you're deciding you want to hunt and it's tied to the food it's tied to being connected to the food i think that you will find that though like we've talked about and you've expressed here there may be some sort of there may be a psychology right now about taking the life of that animal once that happens for the first time and you go through the process and that animal turns into meat. I think that's, that's a game changer in people's psyches is that it was an animal, just like a cow, just like a chicken, just like a, a pig. But once that life is taken from that animal and you take its skin off and you're now butchering it, it's just meat. And it's what you did it for. And now you get to serve that meat to your wife and you get to grind it up and, and make like a gravy for your baby and you get to eat and you get to bring friends over and let them experience it. And they're going to be like, where'd you get this? And you get to relive it and you get to show the reverence and respect again for that animal again and again and again, a hundred times over. So would you recommend that everybody experience hunting because i'm thinking of the people listening to this that are let's say they live in san francisco and they're listening and they don't even own a firearm mm -hmm. and they probably have that stereotype of the hunter in their brain yeah but they eat me it's probably not me yeah <laughs> but uh like it, should that person go hunting to get an education on what hunting really is? And then it would change their mind entirely. So I think you, you, you couch the, you asked the question perfectly. Should everyone experience hunting? I think the answer is yes, because it'll, it'll change your perspective on so many different things. It'll change your perspective on where your food comes from. It'll change your perspective on the interaction with mother nature. It'll also change your perception on a number of different sort of rhetorics. If you had asked me the question, should everyone become a hunter? Not should everyone experience hunting, but should everyone become a hunter? The answer is no. 
we don't have enough resources for everyone to become a hunter. And going back to our earlier conversation, I don't think society was made up of 100% hunters. I think society from day one through today, there's a small percentage of people that identify themselves as hunters. And they're very, very important elements of society and, and do the things like there may be people and I don't know if you may be one of them that when it gets into the moment of taking the life of the animal, you might be like, I, I can't do it. I can't do it. That's okay. That is perfectly okay. Not everyone can do it. Not everyone can take that step. It doesn't mean that you don't want to eat meat right? It also doesn't mean that you're against hunting. To so me, where, where do you see the most resistance when it comes to hunting? Because Blood Origins is really trying to educate people and even just talking about it and understanding it is opening my mind. Uh, and again, I wanted to try to hunt, but now even just talking about the importance of the hunter in, in our society, no matter if it is, you know, the the redneck or the ultra wealthy yeah the one percenters or whatever or the 0.5 percent yeah um like blood origins where do you see yourself in this equation where you feel like the rhetoric has been spread that hunting is bad and what does it look like as an organization for you is it conversations like this sure that's why to, i'm here yeah yeah no, it's to educate yeah, it's to educate. I think the push back comes from the animal rights, radical vegan movements in the world. Okay. The idea of vegeta vegetarianism and veganism, it's a first world construct in that go to Africa, go to the rural villages, ask anybody if they're vegan or vegetarian. You won't find one. Yeah. Okay. I have nothing against veganism. Actually, some of the best conversations I've had were with very centric vegans that actually say, if I was to eat meat, I would hunt. Because it's as close to the vegan ethic that you can get. It's as close to the vegan philosophy and theology that you can get is through hunting. Okay. So the loudest voices against us are the animal rights group that just don't accept anything. And then there's also another sector of, of society, which is an anti-use sector of society. Those that don't believe that you should be wearing leather, that you should be wearing fur, that we should be interacting in nature, we should stay out of nature, humans need to be removed from nature. Humans have been a part of the system since we've been on this earth, and we can argue religiously, philosophically, of how many years those, that is, okay? Is it billions or 10,000 years or whatever? I don't care. I don't want to get into that debate. It doesn't matter. We've been in the system that long. We are a part of the system. And the more people on this earth means that we need to be even more entrenched in stewarding environments and conserving systems and conserving wildlife. We shouldn't be removed because this idea that Everyone says, well, there used to be, I'll use an example, elephants. There used to be 5 million elephants in Africa. When? In 1800? Yeah, probably. How many people were in Africa in 1800? Half a million? 300,000? It's nearly 2 billion people in Africa today. This idea that we have a sea of habitat with islands of humanity is no longer... We have a sea of humanity here in America. We have a sea of industry, infrastructure, people. There's very rare places in America today that you can drive and there's not a human fingerprint on the landscape. Right? And so now you've got these islands of habitat, islands of wildlife, that it's up to us to protect, us to steward. So that's where the rhetoric, the push comes back from is that we believe that as hunters, we are the foremost conservationists and managers in the system, being a part of the system. And that's, you know, people, some people don't like that. Well, back to the Roosevelt reference, it's interesting to me that it was the hunters that 
worked with him to come up with how to protect the animals and to put rules and regulations around things because man's man's own worst enemy. Yeah, and people say, well, oh, no, you guys didn't save animals. Laws saved animals. (laughs) What's the difference? We put the laws on ourselves. Yeah. We said we needed this. We need to stop, you know, we need to control our, the hunters. Done. We'll control ourselves. If hunting is shown to be detrimental to wildlife, who's going to be the first person to stick their hand up and go, we'll stop? Hunters. Yeah. So you have so much education in ecosystems. Mm-hmm. What is a healthy ecosystem? It's a good question. Um, I think today a balanced ecosystem that has maximum biodiversity is as healthy an ecosystem as you can get. And biodiversity is, think of biodiversity as all of the things that are in the ecosystem, from your insects to your reptiles, to your plants, to your flowers, to your trees, to your wildlife. If all of that is in balance with not one overstripping another resource or whatnot, then you've got a healthy ecosystem. Is there a place that we could think of that has a really healthy ecosystem to use as an example? Yeah, probably 20 kilometers down the road or 20 miles down the road. There's lots and lots and lots of places. Like where I live, like yeah. behind us, there's, I think, near 100 acres. Yeah, I'm that sure that, that vacant system land. looks great. Um, it probably could look better. It's not terrible. Um, I think you'll find lots of private land in the southeast. We're in the southeast here that are managed for deer, that are managed for quail, that are managed for turkeys. And when you manage for a species like that, think of it as we in, in, in the scientific ecological field, we'll call that a keystone species. I'm not saying don't everyone jump down my jump down the podcast that, oh, a white tailed deer is not a keystone species. OK, I get it. It's not. But if you're managing for a key species, keystone species like a whitetail or a turkey or a quail, the stuff that you're doing for that animal is benefiting so many other animals. It's benefiting squirrels. If you're managing for deer, you're probably benefiting habitat for turkeys. You're probably benefiting habitat for beetles, um, for native forbs and grasses and all those kinds of things that increases pollinator biodiversity and pollination opportunities in that in that field or the neighborhood so there's lots of things that happen and and that happens all the time it's probably happening a hundred times within a 20 mile radius of where we are right now yeah one of the things i love what you said is uh being in touch with nature man i'm so into that like i uh I've been grounding. Yeah, barefoot walking in the morning. Yeah, and uh, in fact, I have some friends. They they turn me on to this. Uh, it's a it's like a bed cover, and you put it on your bed, and you can actually stick it into the ground. And while you're sleeping, you can actually be grounding, or it has a, a cable that runs outside, and you can stick it in the ground. Interesting. Yeah, we just bought one um, because my, two people I know said it really made a difference. So you're grounding for like eight hours. But we were so, such a part of nature and getting sunlight and vitamin D and hunter gatherer and all of that. And uh, the movements even that we do now in the gym are not the natural movements that we would have done as hunter gatherers. Mm-hmm. Uh my friend's a human biomechanics specialist and basically they frame how to work out based off of what we would have done when we were picking up things or running or jumping or throwing and and that's how they go about exercising not a bench press or a static movement of a curl and uh it's just interesting because i have a hunger for that more and more and life is so noisy and the world we live in is noisy and social media is noisy and the news is noisy and po- politics are noisy. And I, so just speaking for myself and I bet there's people that feel like me where it's like, I just want some peace and quiet and I want to eat healthy food because mm. I've learned and I want to spend time with my family 
and do something that gives me purpose. Sounds like you need to become a hunter. And I feel like the hunting is the next step. I genuinely do. And when and and that's why I was so stoked to talk to you because I'm afraid of it. I'm afraid of the blood. I don't do good with blood. I'm afraid of passing out. Okay. Uh, I'm afraid of or having a panic attack because I deal with anxiety. I'm you know I'm afraid that I'll miss or hit the hit it in the wrong spot. Um, we- like there's a lot of fears that I think would be associated with it. But I know on the other side of it, I would probably feel uh, it would open my mind and open my eyes to something that I will not be able to experience until I've done it. Mm. Just like having Mm. our first child that's 19 months old. Like, you don't know what being a dad is going to be like. And that's super anxious, right? You were super anxious for that too, right? Yeah, and I was, man. And I was scared. and, And it's like overwhelming and then you do the thing and then it puts it all in perspective. Well, the same thing's going to happen. You're not going to, you know, when you go hunting, you're going to be immersed in nature. You're going to be probably the freest you've been because you're out there breathing the fresh air, early mornings, late afternoons. You're going to see a lot of deer. It's not like there's only going to be one. So there's going to be lots of opportunity for you to observe deer and look at them. And you're going to actually, what's interesting when you, when you go hunting, you're going to look at that deer so differently than what you do now. You see deer in the backyard. You, and, and I guarantee you after you've hunted, you'll never see a deer the same way. You'll always see a deer. You'll drive past, you'll be driving down the highway and you'll look into a field and you're like, why is there a deer in the field? Oh, I would set up in that corner. Oh, I would do this. I wonder where the wind's coming from. You start looking at things way differently. And you're going to see a lot of deer and you're going to interact with a lot of deer and you're going to, you know, put your scope on a lot of deer. Not that you're going to kill a lot of deer, but you're just going to go through the motions. And those, all, those, all those motions, all those interactions are going to lessen those anxious feelings. I still, all hunters go through anxiety. If a doe steps out in the field and I'm doe hunting, my heart rate's elevating immediately. My breathing elevates immediately. It's like, man, get a hold of yourself. Like, stop, relax, ch- calm down. The limbic system's just like... Yeah, it's gone. Yeah. But that's part of hunting. That's just like... That's the adrenaline as well, which is probably the addictive portion of why in dating, they call it the hunt or like people, right? And so they they get the kill or the man gets the kill or a woman. And then, like you said, it's almost a letdown after you mm-hmm. kill the animal because it's really about the experience of the hunting. Correct. But then you're turning it into meat, which is the thing that I think is really paramount in this whole conversation, which is what you're doing with the animal when you kill it and you're eating it. And that is really essentially what I'm hearing hunting is. It's a reverence for nature, for wildlife, for ecosystems. And it's something that is to be respected. Uh, And it's something that at the end of the day, you're going to, you wouldn't just hunt to kill an animal unless you're kind of screwed up in the head and you just want to kill stuff. Like you said, Uh, you're hunting because you are going to harvest the meat. Now, I don't know what deer really tastes like. Can you describe it for us non-deer eaters? <laughs> Venison. It is. It is. It, it all depends on who cooks it. So a lot of people are like, oh, it's super gamey. It's super dry. It's super tough. It can be. But if you cook it right, it tastes like filet mignon. It is unbelievable. Really? And I guarantee you, it is unbelievable. Okay. So. Yeah. I love filet mignon. I love red meat. And I would love, honestly, man, if I could, I would just eat uh, like red meat with every meal. Mm-hmm. How is that on cholesterol? No fat. It's a lean animal. Because they're, they're, they're wild. Yeah, it's wild. The only reason they're putting fat on is typically the bucks. You know, they're getting fat to, to go into the rut. If it's a good system, yeah, you're going to have fat on those does, but the fat's not in the meat. The fat is sort of, is it subcutaneous? 
it's sort of fat that's around the it's around yeah. the meat it's around the major muscle groups it's very 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 little fat in the meat itself okay so it's a very lean meat high in protein yep can be it's a, important how you prepare it very important so that in and of itself is an art after the kill That's and right. after you have and a you harvested. look after it you don't want to you know you want to make sure you're prepping the animal correctly you know when you're you've got to degut it right you want to make sure that that the guts aren't going everywhere on on the meat and whatnot so there's lots of things that you are very conscious about and you're conscious about because you want to you you want that meat right you want you really want the the best part of it i want to say one thing that which is important for me to say a lot of people will say, well, it's all good and well. Everyone goes hunting for meat. But how do you explain people going to Africa to hunt? Or going to New Zealand to hunt? Or going to France to hunt? Because you can't bring the meat back. It's illegal. You can't, when you come through the US border, you have to declare foods. And normally the foods are all tossed. You can't bring anything back. And so somebody will say, oh, the people are going to Africa that go hunting are that, that percent that go in just for the kill. Well, which is historically true in the past where there were poachers or people that just killed for tusks. Right. And we learned it in school growing up. Like this is the history. But those of, are poachers. Yeah. But those are poachers. Yeah. And, and yes, you did have people in the commercial ivory trade back in the day yeah. that were hunters. And I think that's our impression culturally in the States. When we think of Africa, we think of oh these are endangered species but continue well then the, well so let me just so for instance let me let's use that example let's take down let's take that rabbit hole okay yeah elephants super controversial people hunt elephants oh my god they hunt elephants they're endangered technically they're endangered technically on CITES and IUCN they are classified as endangered but are they truly endangered? In South Africa, you can't give an elephant away for free. I may have, you may have a farm in South Africa, 10,000 acres or 10,000 hectares, has 12 elephants on it. You don't want the elephants anymore. You tell people, come get these elephants. I'm giving them away for free. Nobody wants them. Too many elephants in Africa. Too many elephants in South Africa right now. No space for them. Really? Botswana, overpopulated with elephants. Zimbabwe overpopulated with elephants namibia right on the cusp of the the top the the this thing that i told talked about right the table yeah, number yeah. right at the table number mozambique right at the table number tanzania over the table number kenya right at the table number elephants aren't endangered in these countries they're actually overpopulated in these countries and so you've got to think about how do you manage elephants in the future this idea that we have to save the elephants, the rhetoric or narrative of saving the elephants. In certain countries, yes. But for the vast majority of countries that have elephants, no. The question is, how do we manage the elephants that we have? And so the only way to manage the elephants that you have is to put value on that elephant. A value on that elephant is someone coming to hunt an elephant. I want to pay $50,000 to hunt an elephant. Okay, great. Where does the money go? Money goes to schools, medical facilities, uh, jobs, uh, you name it, in very, very poor rural places in Africa. So that's benefit number one. For someone who wants to come hunt and kill an elephant, they're not going to take the meat home. Number two, it's like a thousand, no, what's, the, it's tons. It's like 10,000 pounds of meat that goes to people who have no protein access at all, period. That's the village will live for two to three weeks on one elephant. It's the most protein rich resource walking around in Africa today. And so the idea of somebody going to hunt an elephant in Africa seems infamable for somebody like you or somebody that's listening. That's disgusting. That's gross. How can they? It's an elephant. It's it's Dumbo the elephant. It's yeah. It's, it's intelligent. Atrocious. It's atrocious. Yeah. It's atrocious. But there's too many of them. People die from elephants every day. People don't want to live with elephants. How do you how do you manage a, a coexistence between humans and elephants? You give them value. Either that value comes from somebody taking a photograph of that elephant. And you need lots of those photographs to make up fifty thousand dollars, 
or someone comes in and hunts a very selective elephant, an old bull, an old male elephant, and all the money goes to the businesses, the economics, the communities, the people that are getting jobs. Wow. The money is going to building schools, it's building medical facilities, it's putting money into scholarships, it's repatriating uh, people who have lost their lives from elephants. And then you add on top of that the meat. Wow. And then I would imagine the guide would be the one that would say, hey, like this is the old bull Correct. elephant. Correct. So that they're guiding the hunter to shoot and kill it's like, I think of it as an old tree. We had trees fall down in our yard and we were told after these straight line winds came through and knocked down trees, essentially a, a tree, these certain white o or red oaks, I think they were, they reach a maturity point in which they no longer grow. Like they're going to fall over, I guess. Yeah. It's like it grew too big yeah. and now it's going to fall. Yeah. And that's what happened in our yard and some of it hit our house, but all that to say I didn't know that that happened. And I think that that's the same thing in hunting. We don't think about like, oh, that's an old animal. He lived his life. He did his thing. And then the, uh, I guess, cost benefit analysis of killing the elephant to what it's going to do for the village and the people is very interesting. But we would never be told that. Like, I would never know that. If you asked anybody on the street, hey, is killing elephants bad? 99 people would say yes yeah. because they're endangered yeah probably so they're in when they're endangered in like a country does that mean that it's just are they endangered there or yeah. just worldwide worldwide so it's like if they could put some elephants on a boat and ship them all around the world then it would kind of balance things out yeah so for instance that's why i say what i said about south africa like the the people that are anti-elephant hunting Use that example. Okay. You you pay $50,000 for that elephant. Take it wherever you want. Go ahead. Let's go. Bring the money. Bring the trucks. Bring the logistics. And move it. Like we here. Often, here's the elephant. You can have it. You can have 50 12. Gs. You can have 500. You can have 10,000. Come get them. The Botswana president... Um, Botswana has the largest elephant population in the world, in its country. Of a census of elephants in an area of 28% of the country, they had 132,000 elephants. So if you extrapolate from there, and there's elephants everywhere in Botswana, you're probably looking at 150 to 180,000 elephants in one country with 2 million people. Germany started moving forward a law that was to say, we're going to ban the import of trophies into Germany, including elephant trophies. So German hunters who want to go to Africa to kill an elephant, they were going to be banned from bringing elephant tusks and jaw bones and whatever they want hide back to Germany. And the Botswana president went to Germany and he said this. He said, you seem to love elephants more than we do. So I'm willing to give you 20,000 elephants. We'll put them in a plane. We'll bring them to you and let them loose in Germany. Let's see how, how quickly you decide to handle your elephants now. Obviously, they didn't take them up on the offer. But that's the rhetoric. That's the sort of this, this shouting from this side of the table to you on your side of the table, which I don't have elephants. I don't have the problems of Africa, but I'm going to tell you, Africa, how you need to manage your resources. Mm. And these guys over there are saying, we're doing just fine. Why are you prejudicing us by telling others that they can't come and enjoy the resources that we've had, that we've protected, that we've conserved, that we're managing, that we hold? And you're telling us how we need to manage it by stemming an opportunity for economic investment in our country by saying you're not allowed to take it back to your country seems a little elitist mm -hmm. seems a little colonialist it's interesting uh i have cowboy boots made of elephant there we go 
Morris Boot Company in uh, Texas down in Fort Worth has uh, elephant hide and it has these tags in the hide because what he was telling me is you have to have these licenses yeah, to have it. The, it's part of the, the yeah, important and, the, the yeah, permits. Yep. And however, and he, what he said that the elephant hide was actually uh, harvested from the states from uh, this place where like when elephants die, they can harvest their in the United States or they just, I get, don't know. They just get when elephants die in Africa, these guys are the importer for the, uh, I'm the, not the sure products. how it works. All I know is that he has it. And he said, don't leave the country in these boots <laughs> Okay. because he said coming back wearing elephant could be a problem. Is that true? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, but it's the toughest, uh, leather you're not gonna wear through them it's crazy how tough it is mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and it's beautiful mm -hmm. it's beautiful so i don't feel as bad i didn't feel that bad anyway but it's just look it's it's super controversial and i wanted to bring it up because a lot of people will use that as a pointing and say well if you're technically doing it for the meat why do you go to africa to hunt when you can't really use the meat well we'll eat the meat but all that meat's used Every part of the animal is used. All of the guts, all of the offal, everything is used and is given to the communities and is, is packaged up. There's also a game meat system in Zambia and South Africa and Namibia. You can sell game meat in the butcher shops there. So it, it drives an entire economy. And just because I'm not putting it in my freezer, or I can't, it's illegal, doesn't mean that it's not the same as what we're doing here in the United States. Yeah. It's just a bigger animal. On bigger an animal. animal. And I, I would say bigger impacts. Yeah. Yeah. That's something for everyone to think about because we've only addressed really white tailed deer and elephants. But I mean, we could talk all day about all kinds of different animals that we have uh, perceptions or misconceptions about when it comes to the killing and hunting of that animal. Yeah. And really what blood origins is doing is aiming to educate. So how can people kind of learn more? Like if they're listening to this and they're like, man, this is really interesting stuff. Like, and I want to know more, or I'm interested in hunting for the first time. What would some resources be? Where would you recommend that people go? Well, I would first from a blood origins and understanding hunting more and understanding the world of conservation. We've got so much content that you can engage, right? You can just listen and go down multiple rabbit holes of content from us. And we're not hard to find. So if you have a question, you can just DM us. So it's or just at blood at origin. blood origins across all platforms uh, from YouTube to Instagram to Facebook to Twitter to threads to TikTok. Essentially. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I would just, you know, if you have questions, reach out to us. That's why, why we do what we do. But there's also just a heap of educationally related content that we push out constantly about everything around the world. Um, secondly, if you're interested in hunting, there's lots of resources in every state for people to get into hunting. Um, you Obviously, you've got Google and you've got YouTube University. But this, I would start at the state agency, like Tennessee Game and Fish or Wildlife and Fisheries. They've probably got a, an R3 um, coordinator or an R3 department. R3 is this mo movement to reactivate, retain, and recruit hunters. R3, reactivate, recruit, and retain. Reach out to them. They've probably got lots of mentor opportunities. They've probably got lots of beginner courses. They've got probably an online training system. You'll have to get your hunter license first. Like you have to go through a training to get your hunter license in every state in America. Um, that can be done online, that become done, it can be done in person, it can be a combination of the two. But the state agency will, you know, lead the charge in terms of what's going on. There's also lots of nonprofit organizations like Backcountry Hunters and Anglers, um, all of your independent species nonprofits like your Ducks Unlimited, your National Wild Turkey Federation, your Whitetails Unlimited, National Deer Association, all of those nonprofits live in the hunting space. They all have R3 programs. They all are pushing this idea of like recruiting more hunters 
into the fold. So I would, that is, those are the places that I would start. Last question. I think a lot of people are spooked in our world right now because of political rhetoric. And there's always, <laughs> it's so ridiculous. But I saw that the number one movie currently on one of the platforms that we ha subscribe to is called Civil War. And it's like, there's no accident that that's being put as the number one movie on this platform right now to scare American people. Like, that's just what I believe personally. Uh, and, and I think that there's a population of people that are like, what are we going to do to be self-sustaining um, if, if you wanted to be? So for if, if I wanted, let's say, to be able to provide for my family and provide food and be self-sustaining, I would have to learn how to hunt. Correct. Or farm. Or farm. <laughs> or do both. Yeah. Uh, I feel like hunting would be easier, actually. Farming, I can't keep anything alive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not even tomatoes. But... Um, for the for the people the doomsdayers out there like what is there any do you face that or see that in in what you're doing right now with people that are like interested in like what what happens if the grid shuts off and i have to get me do you see a up spike in people's interest in hunting well we just went through it right what did we just go through three years ago uh COVID. oh yeah yes yes three years ago hunter recruitment hunter license sales fishing license sales went through the roof yeah guns i remember handguns everybody, were hard to find everybody yeah. everything went through the roof because all of a sudden there was no meat on the on the store shelves anymore mm. where, where are we going to get meat oh buddy down the road's a hunter we can get some meat from him or oh, hey i need to start i need to go hunting hey joe husband joe you need to go out in the woods and go kill us something. Go kill us something. You know? That went through. All the licensed sales. Women hunters went through the roof. Fishing licenses went through the roof. You just look at all the numbers of the state agencies. 2020, 2021 just went poof, straight through the roof. Interesting. And it's, it's slowly decelerated now as we've gone back to normal. Um, but it just proved a point. Is that, and, the, and here's the other point I'll make. I make it all the time. You can be a vegan of vegans. Everything shuts down and you can't get food anymore and you're stuck in a survival situation. I can guarantee you within a week, you're not a vegan anymore. Yeah. Because you have to survive. Yeah. You have to live. And the only thing that is going to provide you sustenance out there is eating bugs and eating something that you have to kill. Yeah. Eating meat. It's definitely something that uh, I'm excited to par uh, embark on. Well, we're excited for you. And I think that this will be the catalyst to a journey. I hope so. I don't have any hobbies. I'm, I'm searching for them. When I lived in California, I'd go snowboarding. Okay. But living out here, uh, or like we were two hours from the ocean, an hour from the mountains. And in Tennessee, it's very different, you know, landlocked. Uh, it's like hard for me to find things that I want to do. But I know that hunting is a huge, I don't know if it's a hobby. I don't know if it's considered a pastime or a way of life. But All of the above. It, it is huge here. And it's kind of I resisted it because of the country music industry and it being so like country kill or like go hunting, fishing, loving every day and Luke Bryan and stuff like these hunting songs made me not like it. But uh, that's just the way of life for a culture in the South, I think, that grew up and their dads, dads sh taught him how to hunt or shot that first deer together and made that connection and it went through the generations and it will continue to do so. And um, I think that hunting, just like being in nature is something that I crave constantly. And so 
I'm excited just on today's education awesome. to go out because I won't I won't feel as bad now. And let's end on a statistic that you told me, um, which I found really interesting. How many female deer or does I could k- kill potentially if I wanted to? So if you were living in Mississippi, I don't know the Tennessee rakes. Okay. Uh, I should know them. Um, I just have not hunted in Tennessee yet. But I've hunted, you know, since I began hunting when I was 26. So when I arrived in this country, 2003, um, 2006 is probably 2007 is when I've started hunting. So for the last 15 years in Mississippi, Mississippi is the third largest or fourth largest white-tailed deer population in the country. And so the license that you get. So when I went elk hunting, I got one tag it's, for one elk. It's a lottery too, isn't it? For this one that I did was a lottery. Yeah. But there's certain places that you go to Colorado, it's general unit, it's over the counter, but you only buy one tag for one animal. Okay. In Mississippi, you on your license, you have eight tags. Six of those are antlerless doe tags. Or five of them are antlerless doe tags. Then you get two buck tags. And then if you're an archery hunter, you can get another doe tag on top of that so you can essentially put eight deer in your freezer every year on one license that costs you 50 bucks and that is because of the amount the population density of the animal correct and so is it our job as hunters i'm just gonna say i'm a hunter now even though i'm not (laughs) yet but in general uh to in terms of back to your research and education and your PhD of um, of maintaining and being the stewards of a healthy ecosystem. Correct. Our jobs as hunters, let's just use Mississippi and whitetail deer as again as the example. A private landowner in Mississippi is working his land to make it as healthy as it possibly can be. And he's gonna manage his deer herd as best as he possibly can because he's got objectives for his deer herd. He wants a certain number of animals on the landscape. He doesn't want too many animals on the landscape. And he wants to grow, uh, if he is interested in in hunting trophy whitetails, big antlers, he's gonna be very selective in the animals he takes, the bucks that he takes. He's gonna be very um, hard on the does. He's going to take out does because he, the does are competing with resources for the bucks. And so he wants a very balanced system and there's science to how much balance you want. You want a one to one doe to buck ratio or one to two, one buck to two does ratio on your property because then you, it confers advantages for breeding, for fawn delivery at the right time of the year for nutrition that then leads to better antlered bucks, which leads to better trophy bucks, which then leads to a better healthy ecosystem. All of those things a private landowner in Mississippi is thinking about. They're thinking constantly about how can they make the environment better, specifically for the wildlife that they love. And to be able to do that, they have to hunt. Blood origins. Blood origins. Dr. Robbie Kroger, thank you very much for being on the podcast today and uh, this education on hunting and I feel like I could ask a lot more questions, and this is the start of a, of a, probably an interesting journey for me. But it's getting me excited because it's something that I've been thinking about for a couple of years. So thanks for being on the podcast, and uh, hopefully we talk again, and I can, we can do a part two after, after the hunt. Perfect. Sounds good. And uh, again, it's. At blood, B L O O D origins, O R I G I N S. That's it. So go check it out, learn, get educated, and know that hunting is not a bad thing. It is actually an important part of managing and stewarding our land. 100%. Thanks for the opportunity.